The Talking Points with the Training Center starts now. Welcome to the Talking Points with the Training Center. This is Ryan Ozala, the Director of Player Development for Dub Baseball. Today I'm joined in a Pitching Coaches Roundtable. Um, today we've got Tony Kagula from the Chicago Cubs. We've got Harold Mazingo from Mazingo Baseball. We've got Dan Kabuling, uh, our Strength and Conditioning Trainer from ID3 Training, and obviously Eric Waggle, Lead Coach from Dub Baseball and Head uh, Training Coach at the Training Center itself. Uh, so like I said today, we've got a Pitching Coach Roundtable. Uh, first, let's start with some backgrounds on our uh, guys that we've got joining us. Tony, why don't you start us off and give us a little background as to who you are and what, uh, what you bring to the table. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Uh, so as Ryan said, I'm currently a minor league coach uh, in the Chicago Cubs organization. I'll be working with the Arizona League uh, rookie team and then just kind of assisting in overall player development on the pitching side. Uh, previous to that, I spent the 10 and a half years at Westmont College, which is an NAIA program in Santa Barbara, California. Uh, and then prior to that, I coached uh, at, a, at the junior college level and then also coached at Azusa Pacific University, which is currently a Division II, but at that time was an NAI. So spent 15 years uh, in, in college baseball as a pitching coach and um, a lot of time as an associate head coach and recruiting coordinator. And, and like I said, currently in player development with the Chicago Cubs. Thanks, Tony. Harold, why don't you give us a little background as to what you bring and uh, what, you, what you're doing with Mazinga Baseball? First off, thanks for having me on. Um, so, as you said, my name is Harold Mazingo. Um, I am out in the middle of nowhere, Virginia. I grew up in a very small town. Um, I was fortunate enough to be drafted out of high school by the Mets in the 15th round. Um, went to Virginia Commonwealth University. And after three years there, I was drafted in the sixth round. So I played six seasons in the minor leagues with the Royals. And then a few months in the uh, Blue Jays organization. Most of my time was spent actually injured. Um, and then when I got done, I came back, didn't really know what I was going to do. Um, went back to school and in the, in the process started training a few players here and there. And then eventually that led to me opening up a facility and all these years later, here we are. And that's pretty much it. Awesome. Great to hear. Thank you so much, Harold. So one of the first, uh, first topics we're going to talk about today is velocity development. Um, obviously the game of baseball is having this huge spike in velocity development. Um, and velocity guys that are reaching the, minor, or the major so much faster. So, um, you know, how is one? How do you guys feel we should approach this for the, those young kids in the junior high area, the seventh and ninth graders, the, the young high school players, the tenth to twelfth grade guys, and then extending as they go up into the, the situation? Um, Dan and Eric, why don't you guys kind of kick us off and how we do this, and then we can bring in Tony and Harold as to what they're doing and what they see. Well, as far as the younger ages, we really kind of rely on, on implementing a system with them. And, and uh, so much of, of what we do at the younger ages is actually a blessing and a curse. You know, we, we understand the right way to kind of enhance uh, development through a, a kind of a comprehensive arm care system and a strength and development um, system like Dan can implement. Um, and then obviously velocity can follow that. Uh, so much of it, though, from a challenge point of view is creating the right environment. And it's not necessarily like one mechanical cue or fix. And it, it's, it's, uh, it's a struggle on our end because uh, parents want to see like, hey, if you tell my kid to lift his leg this way or do this with his arm, he's going to develop his velocity. Um, whereas we know as, as kind of um, professionals and people that have good backgrounds, um, it's all about creating the proper system that the, the um uh, the, the person, you know, the kid can kind of live within and, and follow and, and thrive in. Um, and it's not that, um, it's not that easy. Uh, and it's not just that immediate feedback that so many parents want. So, uh, you know, we've had some good success with uh, enhancing velocity in young people. And, and I'm sure we'll get into the kind of different, uh, you know, um, different areas that that can kind of entail. But for the most part, it's all about creating a, a really kind of comprehensive and scaffolded system where, where kids can kind of conquer different things and then move up the chain. Yeah, I'd say the, the, probably the biggest is trying to build as large of a foundation as possible. And uh, the average youth player, when they think about, I want to develop my velocity, I want to throw harder, um, or I want to throw strikes and command the zone, is I'm going to go find a pitching coach. And uh, there's obviously great pitching coaches out there. Uh, there's plenty of guys that know exactly what, what they're doing. Uh, I think the, the difference that we kind of bring to the table is, is uh, we can focus on physical development as an athlete and as a thrower. Uh, we can also focus and, and flip that coin and get into the, the pitcher development and command and throwing a good change up and having good off speed and, and doing all that. Uh, but especially for those younger athletes, I think um, building as big of a foundation. And I think uh, a lot of what we do is actually protecting them from the, 
the, the pitching world that's out there and limiting the, the stress that we put on their arms and understanding their bodies and what they're capable of and, and putting them in a position to succeed so that when they are ready for um, that velo bump, we can do it in the safest and smartest way possible. Um, and, you know, versus, you know, kind of, have, I guess you have to walk that line of giving them what they want versus what they need. Uh, and so that's something that we, we really try and hone in on, especially the younger ages. And then we try and deal with, with athletes uh, as an individual, as they get older, where there's some athletes that this is my number one goal. I want to play college baseball. I want to play professionally. And this is where you're at. Okay. Like here's the program. Here's what you need to do. Um, you know, you have that time crunch, whereas where the other athletes, they already throw extremely hard and they're really talented and we have to do a ton to kind of protect them and educate them and make sure that like, Hey, like you are a freshman sophomore and you throw 80 to 90 miles an hour. Like we need to do everything we can to keep you healthy. Cause that's, what's going to separate you from, from the other athletes who are the same age as you are and throw as hard as you do. Um, so yeah, it's kind of uh, insight into our, our process. Hey, Harold, I'll shoot it over to you. How have you approached this with the, the players that you've been training uh, inside your facility? All right. So look, so I'm, I'm going to take it back from the very beginning. And so my opinions here, um, the way I look at this is at the very, very young ages. I mean, I'm talking like, at the like kindergarten type ages, we don't we don't necessarily want to be involved in pitching lessons, okay? Um, so I think that's something y'all hit on. I think that most of us are going to agree on here um, that the mechanics, right, of everything that we get caught up in mechanics, right, can be very detrimental. Um, so at the very very early ages, okay, we want to promote athleticism, right? Um, and that starts that's be, even before kindergarten, right? Just having kids get out there and do kid things, jump, climb, run, all those sorts of things. Um, the, the problem I'm seeing is that just as soon as guys are getting involved, or not just guys, but girls too, um, but as soon as athletes are getting involved in these team sports, that they're, all this stuff is just being coached out of them. Like, do this, do this, do this, right? And we need to get away from that and just let, let kids do what comes natural to them at young ages, and then we work on the other stuff later. At the very beginning stages, it's just about athleticism. Okay, we don't need to think about pitching development whatsoever. Build athleticism, and then we want to start talking about establishing proper movement patterns within the, the sport itself, right? And then we progress to there to adding on strength, power, stability, and then we get into what I, what I consider speed-specific training much later. That's the last domino here, and that's the stuff like the weight of balls and all, after we've already established all the other stuff. And then in the process of all of that, we as coaches have to sort of build build what we what we want to see out of them, right? So we're going to establish what's important. So if we discuss velocity being a big factor, okay, which we all should know that it is a factor, right? Um, not saying that you can go out and just walk everybody. Everybody agrees on that. That should be baseball one on one. But if we set up that that velocity is important, and we let, let that be known. Um, so one of the things I do is I put everyone's velocity on a board, whiteboard in my facility. And that way they understand that it's important, but it also promote, promotes competitiveness inside. Um, it just brings out the best out of everybody, really. Um, they get to make changes when they hit new velocity goals, so it's fun for them. And then plus they're in there with their buddies. They want to beat them. So that's, that's my take on it. Thanks, man. Uh, Tony, what are your thoughts on this? Obviously, you're dealing with uh, some upper echelon players who most of the time come in with some of that velocity. Um, but at the college level, what were you seeing as kind of uh, the approach that you would utilize for that? Yeah, I think uh, it's, a, it's a blessing and a curse to be kind of at the end of the road of the development piece because you see all those things that Harold was talking about that were coached out of the most athletic players at the college level. Obviously, when you get to the pro side, there's a little bit less of that. But, um, I mean, the, the factor of athleticism is so big for us. Um, at the college and at the pro level. But I, I think what Dan said at, at the beginning is, is really, really important. And it's a collaboration. You know, when you get to the upper levels, you have that built-in collaboration with whether it's high performance or athletic training or your strength coaches, um, where that's really the first piece of the puzzle, making sure that guys are prepared um, and don't have a huge deficiency to start moving into the velocity phase of their development. Um, and then it's really comes to the coach of the programming what we're going to try to attack, why we're trying to attack it. I think uh, velocity in a vacuum is great. Um, but if we're going to make a wholesale change to a guy because we think velocity is going to come out of that, what are we giving up to get that? And so um, that's, that's really the risk reward. And so in the college game, uh, you know, wins and losses are at play, 
Um, now on the pro side, we have this really long runway, right? So I'm working with guys that are their first experience in professional baseball and they're, you know, if they're coming to the AZL out of the draft or, you know, as a high school guy or a college guy, their runway is, you know, multiple years. Um, and so you can start to maybe attack some of the deficiencies um, that they have and start building programming um, to, to make sure that we're doing it safely, we're um, prioritizing health, um, and then really attacking the velocity piece, whether it's a mechanical deficiency, whether it's a strength component, all those things uh, come into play. And it's, it's really, really important to not just look at it um, as what the number is, in my opinion, but what we're giving up to get to that number. Um, are we going to make a guy worse and start walking the park or lose some of his individuality that makes him effective if we just chase a number? Is, is 91 with a ton of sink and slider and depth to a changeup um, more uh, of, of an opportunity for him to get to the big leagues than 94 and flat? You know, those are the things that we have to bring into the equation when we're trying to, to decide what we're trying to do. What, what's going to be affected on the, on the back end if we attack with, with the velocity uh, component? But as we all know, watch Major League Baseball, and from the sixth inning on, if you're not 96 to 100, you're probably not in the ballgame. So it's, it's a factor. It's the reality of, of where the game is at this point. And so uh, to think that it's not something that we need to develop and need to attack, uh, I think we're, we're doing our players and ourselves a disservice. Thanks, Tony. So, um, Dan and Eric, you kind of, uh, Tony kind of mentioned the, the de designing programs and methods. Um, why don't you guys kind of take us on to the next question here, which is, you know, how do we do that? What kind of methods should we utilize to, to help these kids um, at the younger levels and some of the things that we're currently doing with the training center? Um, you know, as far as like arm care and velocity and all that, it, it, with so many of these things that goes hand in hand, you can, you can improve arm care and you can improve velocity at the same time. You can improve your command, you can improve your velocity at the same time. It doesn't have to be one or the other. And I think people like to choose sides uh, with this stuff and you don't have to choose a side. You can just develop. Um, you know, as far as what we're doing with, with that whole kind of system between arm care and velocity and, and injury prevention is really uh, kind of taking it on a case-by-case -case basis and also creating uh, you know, tiers or layers to our system uh, based on the different ages. Uh, for example, at the younger ages, we're, we're really, really tight on, uh, on pitch counts and, and stuff like that. And, and that doesn't mean pitch counts are everything. Uh, we're more so tight on uh, that repeated throwing. So we don't let our harder throwers at the younger ages pitch back-to-back -back days. It's, it's pretty rare in our program for kids at the younger age to pitch, or I guess at any age, to pitch back-to-back -back days, uh, d definitely with the harder throwers. Um, you know, like Dan talks about it a lot, the, the whole little league is elbow for a hard thrower now is almost like a rite of passage. If you're kind of tall skinny and you throw hard, you're probably going to get it if you're playing club baseball. So we're, we're trying to kind of limit that a little bit. And, and like I mentioned earlier, we're just trying to create a system where the kids can kind of live within and, and grow up and, and have structure from a young age and, and follow a coherent plan. And it's not just random. Um, so th those are kind of some of the things we do. I mean, Dan, Dan does a lot with the strength movement and the, the actual physical side of, of arm care. Um, what I do a lot on, on my end is make sure that's implemented into games and then also try to educate our families on that. Uh, you know, it's 2020 and there's uh, mountains and mountains of evidence and, and um, information that you can go get on arm care. Um, but uh, I can still uh, go to one of our high school players, high level high school players and say, hey, you know, what's your arm care routine? And they'll, they'll tell me, hey, oh, I ice. You know, like, like that's still a common answer. And so uh, I think so much of what we have to do in our program is just educate everyone. And uh, we, it's kind of a big undertaking, and, and it's a tough, uh, tough wall to break down. But it's, uh, it's uh, that's kind of how I approach it on my end. Yeah, I'd say the the kind of nuts and bolts of it is is figuring out what the, the athlete, the individual needs, and then communicating it to them. Um, okay, here here is that low hanging fruit. We've been talking about that a lot in our our continuing ed and our talk with coaches. Here are the areas that we need to improve on. Here is what we believe is going to help improve that. And then here are the objective numbers that we can use to track, is this program actually working? Uh, again, especially at the younger ages, you, you see, and, and we were all the same way when we were playing, we would use our game outcomes as a, a telltale sign of if we're successful as a player. And there's times as pitchers, you can go out and throw, throw strikes and get people out and still lose. Or you could go throw strikes and, and the umpire just doesn't want to call that outside fastball just because ah, I'm just not going to call it today. This, that's a ball right now. And so, um, you know, trying to get them to focus, especially at the younger ages, on uh, measurables that uh, we, we don't say they're the, the most important thing in the world. You still need to be a good baseball player. You need to have game IQ, you need all those things. 
Um, but especially the, the, the younger ages, those process oriented numbers that can, that we can track uh, and, and regularly track and, and ultimately, um, you know, use to, to promote and show development. Uh, we use weighted balls. We use uh, connector clubs. We use connection balls. We use, I mean, wrist weights. We use uh, shoulder tubes, all of the tools that are, that are out there. Uh, we will try and use and, and get into the facility so that, you know, basically, uh, we can meet as the needs of as many athletes as possible. We, we, we do have some mainstays, but for the most part, we, we try and individualize as much as we possibly can uh, to the athlete and, and then ultimately get them to be successful on the field. Um, so. Thanks, Dan. Hey, Harold, uh, anything that you're doing specifically uh, from a programming or method standpoint that you can add to this conversation? Yeah, so look, from a from an arm care standpoint, I, re I really look at this not necessarily as arm care, but just the entire body care. Um, like it's hard, if you're just doing shoulder work after you throw without taking care of the rest of your body, I don't see if that's going to make a, a huge change in what you're trying to do. Um, and when we're talking about arm care, right, most of us are really talking about recovery, right, um, trying to just limit workload. Um, there's two things I really want to touch on with that. And that's number one. Um, I think we saw this for a long time here that we were just kind of, I, I, don't, I hate to use the word babying, but we were being way too um, passive on what we were trying to do, right? So we kept trying to limit what the guys were doing as opposed to trying to build up a tolerance for what was to come. Um, if kids are not throwing routinely, it's hard to handle the stresses that we're, of, of pitching. Pitching is going to be stressful. Um, we talk a lot about arm stress, but Stress itself does not have to be a bad thing. Stress is needed for adaptations to occur. Um, we need to be able to, to, we need to figure out for our body how to handle those stresses, right? So a lot of these young kids are just unstable. So we're asking them to go out and not throw during the week and then throw 75 pitches in a game on, a, on an unstable surface, just not good for them. Um, so we, we actually do a lot of um, isometric holds with the young guys while pulling them in different directions. So. Um, and I've shared this with Dan. Um, we actually have bands that we pull them or I'll get up there and push them. They'll get in a push-up position and I'll just push them from different directions or have a band pulling them in different directions, holding the lunge from different directions with a band pulling them is what I'm talking about. Um, and then the other, the other aspect of this is that that doesn't get talked about nearly enough is that when it comes to recovery, we need to make sure that our body is recovering. Um, so we keep compounding this arm care stuff and throwing um, – without the body for body recovering. If kids are sleeping four hours a night and then trying to just bang out all kinds of shoulder work as a recovery, probably defeating the whole purpose of it all anyway. Thanks. Uh, Tony, I know obviously we can't get into specifics and like what kind of programming you guys are doing with the Cubs, but do you have any general kind of conversation to add to this uh, about the programming and methods utilized? Yeah, I think, I think what Harold touched on is really, really important to understand what you're trying to accomplish on that specific day. And so, you know, if, if we're going to stress the body with in-game work um, or a bullpen or a side, if that's a, if that's a high stress day, um, we also can do other stuff that's high stress if, and make that entire day high stress, whether it's going in the weight room after doing some sort of conditioning work after um, that's hard because your body is stressed. Um, but then making the recovery day an actual recovery day. I, I can't tell you how many times, um, you know, at, at the college level with my guys at Westmont where we were implementing plyo throws uh, and it was a recovery day, um, that I'd have to remind them that it's not plyo recovery velo day, right? They don't understand what they need to do to actually allow their body to recover. And so, um, or take a day off, like that's, that's also important. You know, we have to build those days in. Uh, so as a coach, um, you know, again, at the college level and the pro level, it's going to be more of a collaborative effort um, rather than, you know, hopefully they have enough of a, of a foundation and a baseline to know what their body needs, but really having an open dialogue of how does your body feel, them being honest with you, and then building in what that day needs. I, I may program a medium intent day, you know, with, with a, a short box on the mound, and that guy might not be ready to do that. And so we have to, we have to change on the fly. And so I think having open dialogue um, as a player and coach, that relationship is so important and you hear it a lot like, Oh, I'm a player's coach or, Oh, I have an open door policy, but do you really allow that player to speak how they're feeling? Because that's a, that's a major part of development too, because at the end of the day, it's their career and they need to know at some point you got to take the, um, 
you know, the training wheels off and they need to take ownership in their development. So they, the programming needs to be a collaborative effort, in my opinion, once you get to a certain point. And so being able to have that dialogue is important. Um, and, and all the things that the guys talked about are, are things that, that we're looking at and constantly trying to, to get better at. I don't think it's an exact science. I don't think anyone has it figured out. Uh, but the more we talk about it, the more we discuss it, the more we're willing to test things. Uh, I think the closer we're going to get to, to building a, what's right for each player. Awesome, Tony. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so hey, one can of the I jump back in? Please. Can I jump back in one more thing? Um, from, from the youth standpoint, I, I forgot to mention this. Another thing that um, I really, really fully believe and I try to stress to my guys is that I, I really just want them pitching once a week. Um, I really don't – if they go out and throw three innings, 45 pitches, right, like that sounds like, oh, I didn't really do much. I can come back and pitch very shortly. But that's really closer to probably 100 throws or so off the mound that day. I mean, people never take into consideration the bullpen stuff before games and those warm-up pitches in between. Um, so my advice always to guys is uh, the other thing, too. I hate the idea of throwing back-to-back -back days at the young ages anyways. Um, but I really try to stress, go out and throw a couple innings one time a week, and that's it. Um, I don't like guys trying to go out there and throw five or six innings at the, at the young level. So I just like two or three innings go attack some hitters and then be done for the week. Go play somewhere else in a few days. And if you really think I'm about it, sure I made that clear. Yeah. If you think about it, if guys are doing, want to look at research, I mean, it's all, it's all out there. Uh, you can go on like MILB.com and look at the minor league season. It's rare for minor league pitchers, even when they're getting ready to go and pitch back to back days in the big leagues to throw back to back days in the minor league season. And those are, you know, the best of the best. And so if we're not willing to put a 24 year old prospect out there to throw 20 pitches back to back day, why should an eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year old kid be doing it? I just think um, it's, it's really counterintuitive. Now we've also talked about how are we preparing those guys when they do get to the big leagues and they have to throw back to back days. And so it's an ongoing conversation, but um, you know, it's happening uh, very, very little at the minor league level. So why would it ever happen? Uh, at the lower levels when guys are way more underdeveloped and not ready for that type of stress. Yeah, I think you guys both hit that nail on the head and, and how important it is keeping these kids um, aware of what's actually going on in a full, full outcome in the day. Um, sticking to this velocity development kind of topic that we're sticking on, um, I know obviously a couple of you guys have focused on the idea of ground force and how we can use it to develop velocity. Um, Harold, I know this is kind of an area that you've been really big on, so why don't you kind of take the lead on this and what you've been doing with it? Um, and then, Tony, you can kind of bring in a little bit of your ideas as to what ground force can do and, and how valuable it is. Yeah, so look, I, I actually really think this is a big deal, and I don't think people understand it at all. Um, and part of the reason I don't think people understand it is because when, when we, this whole idea of this, this big data in baseball now, right, we keep wanting to look at the raw numbers, right? And when you look at ground force, you can't look at raw numbers. If you're looking at raw numbers, you're going to think that this stuff's irrelevant. Um, and that's not the way it is at all. Um, so I am actually a huge fan. I think it's highly misunderstood. I'm actually creating a video series about it right now. Um, kind of a cool thing. I'm actually using a Wii board to do this. Um, it took me about a year and a half or so to figure out what in the world I was looking at. Because as I said, the raw numbers mean nothing. Um, so you keep thinking there's going to be something there, and there's not. And it's frustrating. And then finally one day, somewhere around the first of this year, Right around January 1st, um, I had three guys in that had three very, very different movement patterns, and something just jumped out and it made me scratch my head, and I started to dive into that a little bit more, and it just kept showing up. And then so I knew I was on to something, um, and with some talks from some very smart individuals, I don't know if I can mention their names or not, so I'll just leave them out for now. Um, they kind of had seen the same things with some stuff they were doing, so I knew I was on the right track. Um, and then just kept plugging away, plugging away. And now I have come to believe that essentially ground force can, ground force essentially tells you, right, the data that comes out of ground force, and this is the force itself and then center of pressure data, okay? So both, all right? So basically where force is being applied at all times too. Um, I think it actually tells you exactly if your quote unquote mechanics works or not, um, whether or not they're good or not, that's um, from the lower half standpoint. Like I said, there's four things that I look at. Um, one is how they're loading into the back legs. So there's 
the, the big deal here, I'll, I'll talk about it on this podcast. I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, the big deal here is that peak ground force occurs during the sit. It doesn't occur from any kind of push off or anything like that. Um, and we, there is a drive phase, so I, I don't want to misinterpret that. But I think a lot of guys get in trouble at youth levels because they're taught to push off so much. And when they do that, they never get into the load. The push is a, or drive is an unloading mechanism. And we have to load it first. Um, and so that's what I think is happening a lot. A lot of the young guys come in with no load whatsoever. So we want to see peak force occur during the sit. And then there's that transition from the sit to the drive phase, I call it. It's essentially, we're looking at how rapidly that um, the transition from the sit to the drive occurs. And then we are looking at how the transition from back leg to front leg. So we're really looking at a ratio there, specific sort of ratio we're looking at. Um, force from the back leg to the front leg, um, and then looking at how the front leg stabilizes, which is also a very misunderstood concept because we're talking a lot recently about uh, the front leg block, right? And then like the way the knee extends, which the knee does extend in most pitchers, but it's not an active extension. Um, it's a byproduct of what's happened before, in my opinion. Um, I think the front leg has one job and one job only, and that's to resist momentum and just to stabilize. That's, that's really its only role. Everything else is a byproduct. So hopefully that makes some sense. But Absolutely. That definitely helped me give some added, some added insight. Tony, anything you want to add to kind of what your thoughts are on ground force and how you guys can uh, utilize it? Yeah, I think it's, it's been something that, uh, you know, as a pitching coach, we've always talked about it, right? Use the ground, stay in your leg, like different things that we use terminology-wise or something that we, we can see on video. Um, it's exciting to be able to put that stuff into numbers now and actually see is a guy, you know, leaking some energy um, as he's moving down the mound. Um, you know, we talk a lot about like guys being having their whole foot in the ground um, and guys that are in their toe or in their heel or in the center of their foot and how that, um, you know, affects something later on down the road. The, the Usually something that's, you know, as a pitching coach, when you see something that's happening at ball release, it, it happened way before that. And so being able to, to go backwards and seeing what's going on, um, you know, in that, you know, at peak leg lift, uh, what, what do those numbers look like? What do those look, numbers look like as we're going down the mound? And then what, what do those look like when, when the front foot hits the ground? I think those are things that now you can measure and you could probably see it with your eyes, but to give the numbers to the players, to get them to buy in of, of how important it is, I think that's important. And then, you know, what the data is going to tell you is, hey, these guys are the elite throwers and these are, you know, what their numbers look like. Um, and here's what your numbers look like. Uh, you know, can we, get that, can we get them to match up? Is there some sort of similarity in ground force at leg lift for the best throwers and ground force as they're moving down the mound? And, and is there a deficiency in other guys? Are we seeing trends? Um, and that's what's exciting about having so much data available now is that we can, we can start bucketing guys into where their deficiencies are. These are the guys that do it really, really well. And the numbers tend to be, you know, in a certain area and here are the guys that aren't doing it well. And they're, they're showing similar data with ground force. And, and then we can start attacking it with, you know, what coaches know best is, is maybe how to change a movement. So uh, yeah, we're starting to get into that. I know the pro game is starting to get into that with some, some companies that have specific ground force mounds um, that are able to, you know, plug into a computer and tell you that stuff as it's going on. I've seen some presentations that are really exciting. Um, and so I think you're going to see it popping up more and more. But again, the data is only as good as the people that are interpreting it. Um, you know, data in the wrong hands or dating being misinterpreted um, is really useless. I think Harold was trying to trying to get to that a little bit. Um, you know, the data is one thing, but being able to use it uh, successfully and, and, and pass it on to your players to actually utilize it and makes, you know, significant changes is is kind of the next step in and something that's fairly new with the with the ground force data that's that's coming out. Awesome. Hey, look, I hate to keep doing this, but can I jump back in one more time? Yeah, please, I hate to keep absolutely. doing it. I'll try to stop. Um, so I wanted to um, – something that Tony had just mentioned um, with guys getting into the toe, right? Um, so that actually is something at the, the lower levels, like the youth. That's one of the first things that almost always goes wrong, right? What, it, what happens out of leg lift is the thing that most people get wrong – if it does get off, as he said, it's going to affect everything later, okay? So one of the really cool things that we're doing, because we can see the stuff as it's happening, right? So I'm using a Wii board. How silly does that sound, right? Um, but so the, the software that comes with it, 
like, I'm sticking this thing on the ground in front of the athletes, and they're they're getting set up. And these are young kids too, and they're getting set up on one leg, and then we're just watching. The first thing I have them do is just stand on one leg and feel and watch what's happening with the with the uh, software when they get pressure to the toe to the heel. They just sway back and forth, right? So they feel what toe and heel feels like. And then from there, they go into the sit, trying to do the same thing, right? And they're trying to, as they sit, push weight back towards the heel, okay? And then, so they're actually seeing this right in front of them, right? And then we transition. The next part of this, this is the really cool thing, because I have essentially, um, these guys do it completely on their own now. I set up the, the, the Wii, I set up the software, and I get out of their way. They know what they're doing now, um, which is really cool to see. Uh, they, they start off on that one leg, and they go into their sit. If they see the weight shift back to the heel, they pick up the – we always do this in front of a plyo wall. They pick up the plyo wall and throw. If they see weight shift to the toe, they stop and reset and start all over again, okay? Now, along with that – so it's been pretty cool to see, right? Um, and then the other thing along with that is we talk about um, the numbers, like what they're trying to do from whatever they are on one leg. So force plates are really just a fancy way of telling you how much you weigh at any given time, right? Um, so when you're on one leg, it's telling you how much you weigh. And as you sit, you're going to weigh something different. You're going to – Lance Wheeler is probably one of the best on this topic. He talks about making uh, making yourself way more, right? More making – I don't know exactly his terminology, but I think he says make yourself way more, or make the ground way more, whatever it is, right? Um, and that's essentially what we're trying to do. So we, we talk about those numbers at first, um, and then when guys get that right, we just get – I just get out of their way. They see the weight shift back to the heel and throw. They see it shift to the toe. They reset and do it all over again. That's awesome. That's some great insight for us. And I think that transitions really well to Dan and what you've been doing with kind of our um, force feeling insoles that we've been using at the training facility. Uh, why don't you kind of give us a little background on what we've been trying to utilize there and, and how we're going to kind of keep picking up on that. Yeah. So as, as um, I, I think I, like all of this kind of started happening all at the same time where uh, I was talking with Harold and uh, Eric was going through uh, the on-base shoe cert and it kind of just all magically lined up where all of a sudden we have these inserts that can be put into shoes and they don't tell us the amount of force, but uh, I, I do think, like you were saying, pretty important in that feedback of where is the force? Uh, where, where are you putting your uh, weight into the ground? Uh, and so we've implemented that as an assessment tool just to kind of, you know, first see, okay, what do you bias towards? Um, we, we um, I think one of the parts that was, is pretty cool, and then I don't, again, I think that came, this came from conversations with you, Harold, uh, is you can tell uh, the insult, inserts go into your shoe. They'll tell you the percentage of how much your weight is on your back foot versus your front foot. Uh, and then we can obviously XMO it, and you can tell the transition of where, once you go from 100% in your back foot to 100% on your front foot, or whatever percentages those may be. Uh, and then I'm, I'm really excited to look more at, okay, that timing of that, and then where is our rest of our body? Uh, I think that it can give us some some insights to uh, obviously velocity development. And then you know, as we transition and talk a little bit more from an arm care standpoint, I think it's going to tell us a little bit more um, from the kids that might uh, may, maybe they're a little early with their, their chest or their arm or they're late with their chest and their arm. And, and then we can use that again as, as a training tool to then, Hey, like you're going to wear these and it's part of your, your movement prep, say in your, your warm up before you do your throwing or it's in your bullpen and you're going to be going through your bullpen work with that on. Uh, from a strength training standpoint, you know, everything that we do is, is trying to strength, like is to uh, improve the amount of force the athlete can first uh, create, but then I also, you know, absorb and stabilize, like you're saying with that front leg. So uh, those four, the inserts, the part I, I do like about them is, is they're simple. It's easy. It's quick. You put them in their shoes, you take a video of them and you instantly can show them. And, and I'm sure the we board is the exact same way. It's, it's, it's a pretty cool tool. Awesome. Uh, Eric, anything you want to add into that? Or do you want to take over this next question, which is a big one for us, is the arm care and injury prevention and kind of uh, what those type of programs look like and what's in valuable form? Um, I mean, it's just as far as the, the ground force stuff, we've, we've just, we're just scratching the surface on them in our, in our facility and, and using those insoles. I think uh, the, the, the instant value we've seen is the guys that not only pitchers, but hitters too, that just internally rotate that backside a little early, you know, that, that quad dump. Um, we've seen, we've been able to kind of give them that visual of uh, uh, with those insoles and that and that app on uh, they can see because they can see their pitching motion happening and then they can also at the same time the force in their in their feet and they can kind of see how quick that they get on their toes and they can kind of just look up and, and see like like they're not even really down the hill much and, and they're already dumping energy uh, forward and, and, and not kind of keeping it there so 
uh, yeah, definitely something we want to get into more. And uh, that's why I was kind of excited to have these guys on the call to, to learn a little bit more about that and how we can use that to, uh, to, to help our guys a little bit. So, uh, yeah, as far as arm care and prevention, we've kind of covered a lot of it, but, um, you know, to me, I'm a system guy, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a strong believer in, in uh, creating a really comprehensive and integrated system that people can kind of live within and kind of be those guardrails and, and guide them down the, the right path. But, um, you know, we've had a ton of success with arm care. We've had a ton of success rehabbing guys that have gotten hurt or, or guys have shown up to us a little bit as damaged goods. And, and we've kind of shown them how to do it the right way. And uh, there's, there's no one-stop shop or instant uh, gratification kind of approach to any of this. It, it's very much, you have to have a really, really strong plan to follow uh, that's individualized and, and you got to kind of just execute it well all the time. Awesome. Hey Harold, any uh, on this arm care injury prevention? Any like go tool, go to tools, exercises, modalities, like anything that you do or in your assessments that you kind of utilize that are really big for you? Yeah, so I mean, like like I was saying earlier, I kind of look at this as a full body thing, right? So what if everything starts from the? No, I don't want to say everything starts from the ground. That might not be true. May or may not be true. But it, just everything affects everything, right? Um, so. The one thing that when it comes to arm care, the one thing that I'm adamant about is that the way that we have these return to throw protocols right now, um, the in terms of how they've been done for a long time, need to be redone and need to be revisited. Um, so um, I'm, I don't want to say I'm smart enough, but I'm, yeah, I guess I'm going to say I'm smart enough to know that those aren't great, but I'm also smart enough to know that I don't know what I'm doing with either. So I usually lean on guys and I've leaned on motives um, heavily here for the last few years when it comes to return to throw, um, return to throw stuff by using um, modus throw, um, which if you're not familiar with that, it's a little sleeve with a sensor in it, it tells you elbow stress. It's, it's just really monitoring your um, AC, so your ACR, so acute to chronic workload. Um, but I've leaned on those guys to really help me understand what I'm trying to do within those systems. And I haven't really tried to do that myself. I've, 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 like I said, I've just leaned on them. Awesome, thanks. Tony, uh, anything else that you got for this arm care injury prevention? Like we mentioned, we've kind of hit it on the head, but any tools or assessment things that you guys utilize and, and, and find value from? Yeah, I think the assessment piece is essential. Um, I think, you know, different areas of mobility, hips, ankles, all that type of stuff, how a guy moves is, is usually going to, um, you know, or doesn't move is going to, you know, have some, some sort of a, of a tell on, on can they stay healthy or not. Um, and in those things, more is not always better. I've had plenty of cases. I had, I had a guy at, at, uh, at Westmont who was a really, really tight thrower. Um, he didn't move very well and he was a 90 mile an hour guy. And so it was almost like the joke of the pitching staff, like the guys would get on. I'm like, Hey, if you move better, or if you were more mobile or more flexible, you'd throw 95, you throw 90, 91. Um, and so the summer after his sophomore year, that's all he focused on. And he never threw a pitch 90 miles an hour again. And so um, knowing that it is an individual piece, uh, it's not, uh, you know, if you get to this number, as far as like a mobility range of motion type of thing, um, that you're going to be better. More is not always better, but really assessing the individual and knowing what type of mover they are. Are they, are they hypermobile? Are they really strong and not mobile? And what, what do those things mean to that individual player? And then building out a program. Um, from that obviously I have the I'm fortunate now because that stuff is all taken out of my hands uh, but we can still evaluate how they're moving as far as like if they're doing plyo drills and they're a really tight mover we can start talking to high performance and saying hey you know it looks like you know his range of motion uh, his external rotation is really bad is there something going on somewhere else that's causing that um, and really trying to to look at that guy individually so um you know, I think we use a lot of tools that a lot of other places are using. I, I did at Westmont with, you know, J bands and lacrosse balls and foam rollers and trying to get guys ready to throw, actually having a built-in warm-up. Um, so it's not, it's not a reactive thing. It's a proactive thing and getting guys actually ready to throw um, and getting their body ready to go. And then when there is some sort of injury, really assessing where is that coming from? Because sometimes I know I've talked to Dan about this, you know, a shoulder injury or an elbow injury might be coming from somewhere else. That's where the pain is coming out of, but it could be, a, it could be coming from some other movement or some sort of tight area that we need to address uh, to try to take the pressure off of the end point where it's coming, where the pain might be coming from. 
Dan, why don't you kind of add a little bit of what we're doing with our assessments? Because obviously, um, I think you guys are both kind of on the same same page that you and Tony were. So give us a little insight as to what we're doing, kind of uh, your thoughts as to the assessment and why it's valuable. Yeah, I'd say we, we try and attack it from both ends. Uh, my expertise is bringing it from the physical standpoint. So what is their hip range of motion, ankle range of motion, shoulder range of motion? Uh, what are the numbers that we see as being uh, desirable? Uh, this is a lesson I've learned and why I've had that conversation with, with Tony. Um, and I remember it a very vivid conversation. The exact, I remember the exact picture you're talking about where I kind of came to that realization that, you know, the more isn't always better. We, we need to address these as individuals. And then um, as we went through the, the driveline pitching foundation certification, a big one that was really hammered home was like, are they already good? And then are you willing, uh, if you're going to make changes, um, are you willing, like Tony Brett mentioned earlier, are you willing to, to potentially subtract from a certain area um, and, and what's the risk reward for that? So um, assessments are huge. Uh, I think a lot of times, again, at the youth level, they want uh, bullpen and game and pitching solutions to what are most likely a movement and strength and stability or flexibility sometimes issues. Uh, so educating the athletes on, on that and, you know, um, making sure when they're going through their routines, um, the arm care that you do before you throw and after you throw is just as important as the deadlifting and the squatting and the lunging and all the stuff and the core work that we're doing. And all of this is focused on your development. There isn't, if you know, if there was one thing that was going to do it, it was bands or weighted balls or sprint work instead of long distance running. If it was just one thing, everybody would throw hundred miles an hour and nobody would get hurt. Like if it was that simple, um, you know, this, this whole thing would be super easy. <laughs> um, so trying to communicate from, from that standpoint. And then, also take into account what they're doing in games. I think that that's a, a big thing uh, that you, you see within the organizations, uh, communicating with players and coaches and knowing, okay, what is the stress this player is going, uh, going through in games? How do we manage that stress in the gym? Make sure that we're doubling up on that uh, and then making sure that they recover uh, in between their outings. Awesome. So one of the other uh, focuses that we want to talk about, and, and Harold, you kind of started us off on it, was that idea of return to throwing. Um, so in your idea, Harold, you know, what's kind of the personal experience you've seen with the return to throwing programs and uh, what are your kind of thoughts as to uh, key factors that you've found positive outcomes from? All right. Yeah. So look, like I said, um, I spent most of my professional career hurt. So personally have a ton of experience, unfortunately, with return to throw program. Um, but I just kept going through a cycle of um, like shutdown, um, do these certain drills, to, like, like y'all were talk, discussing a while ago, like trying to create more mobility here, more mobility there, and then get on this return to throw program. And it just, it was a repetitive cycle of, okay, I'm returning, and then almost immediately I'm hurt again. Um, and, and I think the reason for that has been is because most return to throw programs are too aggressive. Um, you have the, like they start off really, really slow, and they pick up big time, and they kind of stagnate, and they pick up again. There's, there's no real, like, gradual buildup. It's, it's just a bunch of peaks and valleys along the way. Um, so um, one of the biggest things that I've seen with one of the kids I'm working with, um, he's on a throwing program where, um, and he had Tommy John surgery with Dr. Andrews, and they've essentially told him, do do what feels right. Uh, there's, there's no real structure to it whatsoever. Um, and he came back in almost no time. Um, hardly any setbacks along the way. Um, so yeah, um, so I, I would say maybe, maybe there's something to learn from that. Um, so yeah, that's all. I mean, he's, he's still trying to figure out when to push and when not to push those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, yeah I mean, take, take the pro take it slow. There's no rush, um, and do kind of what feels right there. Um, that's my biggest thing I think that I've taken from this. Um, I think we put so much stock into, um, the, the physical aspect of like making making this more mobile and making this stronger and that sort of stuff um when, and then we go out and try to have these huge increases in workload through a return to throw program it just again defeats the whole purpose so it's got to be a little bit smarter on how we're integrating it all awesome hey, tony uh, i know obviously you guys kind of have similar situations where you got guys coming back from injuries and uh, different time frames for when they're coming back to return to throwing. So anything that you've kind of seen as be positive outcomes or things that you can really utilize? Yeah, I think similar to Harold, I mean, I spent my entire college career hurt. I had Tommy John and labrum surgery before I was 20 years old. And so these types of things hit home, you know. And so I think 
same thing that Harold was talking about. I've seen some scary programs that are like basic programs that, you know, at a certain point, they're asking an athlete coming back from an injury to throw more than I would ask them to throw on a regular throw day. Um, you know, a hundred throws at 120 feet and then take a 10 minute break and then throw 50 more. Like that's a lot of stress for a guy that's coming back. Um, just putting a blanket program on, on something. And I think that the thing that we've talked about most is how individual each guy is. And so to just put a blanket program on a guy that's coming back uh, from an injury is, is really challenging. Um, you know, I think it, it all, it all depends. I think, um, you know, really trying to give that, that player some, freedom to to have some say in how he feels rather than okay well my program says I have to make 50 throws today and I feel really really bad and it's only going to make it worse I think there's a psychological piece that comes into play that a lot of um, people overlook when it comes to throwing uh, especially coming back from injury because for a lot of guys especially a young guy that had Tommy John his his first throws from 30 feet the first time he picks up a baseball like those are scary for him and so not understanding the psychological component that goes into that program is is really really important so when we just throw a back-to-back every other day this distance this amount uh, I think we we can for some guys set them up for for failure early um, and I think giving them some some ability to to design their own program based on how they feel uh, under the, hopefully the care of of someone that that knows what they're doing so they don't progress maybe too fast I think is important but I think having a cookie cutter approach to something that's so individualized is, is really, really challenging. So I, I don't know that I've per se witnessed a bunch of things that I've seen like, Oh, this is, this is the best. Uh, but I know that the coming back from injury personally, and then seeing guys that have had injury at the college level, um, there's a psychological component that I think we need to take into consideration that, that a lot of time gets overlooked that really hampers that guy uh, because they're just seeing numbers on a page and, and wondering, can I or can't I do that? And now they're changing what they're doing. Um, they're not being athletic. They're not being natural uh, with their throwing. And so I think that that's something that we need to take a good hard look at as well. Dan and Eric, anything you guys want to add to kind of what we've been doing with return to throwing on guys that we've had working with us? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 really kind of goes hand in hand with some of the arm care stuff and and the the on ramp. And I think is such a huge part of this. You know, the the on ramp of, of of a rehab guy that just came off a of surgery or serious injury is going to be real similar to the on ramp on, on what we would do early in a you know to to prepare a pitcher for their season and knowing that the vast majority of arm injuries happen early in a season. Um, that kind of throws out the hold um, workload and pitch count kind of a thought process to arm injuries and and really. Uh, what what happens is is early in the season guys just aren't prepared you know we haven't like like the, like the guy said earlier you know we, we haven't prepared them for the kind of stress that they're going to face so um you know when we're looking at that on ramp or that return to throwing it's, it's really having a super logical and, and um sometimes even boring progression um to their to their throwing and their the stress that we're giving them and, and um you know i like to add just a little bit of stress each week and, and just give them a different stimulus to kind of uh, you know, can, makes their, their their body and their arm adapt to things. And, and Dan and I kind of do that hand in hand uh, with our guys that we're returning to throwing and, and we tackle it from both sides. Dan, anything you want to add into that? Yeah, I'll, I'll make mine real, real quick and, and straightforward. I think um, trying to, yes, 100% taking account the, the, uh, the mental, the, the, emotional side of it. Um, I think obviously, again, I think all of us have had arm injuries, myself included, and uh, putting yourself in the athlete's shoes of, yes, this, this is um, scary. I, I derive some of my personal value from like my ability to play baseball and be a pitcher and, and I'm the guy on the mound and I'm a team and, and all that. Um, and then trying to focus that onto um, objective numbers. So I try and put everything in, into like a, a kind of a weight room focus where it's okay. We have volume, the number of throws we're taking intensity, how hard are we trying? And then that is how much stress we're putting on the body. Um, obviously if you have the motor sleeve, we have motor sleeves at our facility. Um, it's a great way to track that stress that you have on your arm and, and use that as feedback and pair that up with how you're me mentally and emotionally feeling with what are the numbers telling us and then prescribe the, the throwing each day based off of that. Uh, if you don't have that, I think a radar gun is also a, a good tool that you can use to manage the amount of stress that you're putting on your arm. Um, not every throw, you know, uh, me throwing 90 miles an hour, which I never did, versus somebody else throwing 90, the stress on each, each player's arms are going to be different. But me throwing at 70 versus me throwing at 80 
uh, is a valid way, I think, to, to measure the stress that we're putting on, on my individual arm. So using that as feedback too, uh, we have kind of a, you know, a velocity-based uh, in, in indoor long toss protocol that we can use to gradually build up and in, in on-ramp players. And then obviously you can do it outdoors. Long, long toss outside too is also a good, good option. So just trying to manage the stress on the arm and make sure that their body is ready for it. I think supervision is a big piece of this too, because I think a lot of times I know from personal experience, it's very easy. Uh, let's take like a college setting, for example, where you don't have a big coaching staff um, and maybe you, you have a thin training staff and it's an in-season type of return to throw protocol. A lot of times that player is doing that self-led. And so I think being creative, finding the time, whether it's we're going to video it, we're going to set up the radar gun so we can, we can track it, you know, get another player to track effort level. Um, if it's, you know, if it's appropriate, um, I think those are big pieces that, uh, we could be missing because a lot of times it is self-led. And so, so the player is, is, uh, at least on the college side, uh, at the small college level, the player is kind of making his own assumptions on how he feels and what he should do. And so really finding time as a coach or, um, as a player to have that dialogue is really, really important because I, I just think that. I know I was guilty of it as a young coach. Like, hey, I have these 15 other guys that I have to worry about getting ready for a game. And, you know, this guy, he's important to me, but he's also not impacting my team right now. And so he can go do his throwing program during practice. But, um, you know, we could, again, we could be leading, leading a guy down a, a, a dangerous path of um, leaving it all up to himself um, and not helping him through that process. Hey, Dan, to jump in on something you said too. Uh, when it comes to workload management. So obviously uh, I'm a huge fan of the modus sleeves there. Um, but I think when we're looking at workload management and the stress of the arm itself, we're, we're just talking, we're just focusing on one piece of the puzzle, right? Um, we really need to start taking into consideration essentially the entire central nervous system, right? Um, so I think modus is a great tool for, um, in, a, in a vacuum, I guess I would say, figuring out the stress place on the arm. Um, but I think there's more to it. We need to look into the entire body in terms of workload management and not just the arm itself. Awesome. I think you guys definitely nailed that one on the head. And uh, it, we are all seeing that it's a relationship building situation where you have to understand the player and understand kind of what they're going through as well. Um, to kind of go to this next subject, obviously the, the rise in technology in the game of baseball has been a huge impact uh, positively for the game. Um, and we're starting to see guys who can really design pitches uh, and not only pitches, but the entire repertoires um, to find success at the next level. So um, Harold and, and Tony, why don't you guys start us off on kind of what pitch design looks like for you guys um, and how you're kind of using it and what's kind of differing between maybe a high school player and a college player uh, or a younger player at all. I can start it. I'll, take I'll, it first, I'll, I'll start that one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think uh, there's definitely um, with the, with the tech that we have, I think it's really, really become something that's really, really useful for our guys. I think at the college and the professional level uh, is what I'll speak to. I think um, really starting off with like a baseline test of what is the raw num what do the raw numbers look like, right? Have a guy throw his bullpen with the rap soda, with the track man, whatever it might be, um, before you start, you know, uh, having a – a biased opinion of what you think this guy's arsenal should look like. Um, and look at what the data tells you. I know um, there were a lot of times where, you know, the adage of throw the ball down in the zone, down in the zone, down in the zone. And then you see a guy that has unbelievable carry on his fastball. And uh, when he pitches up in the zone, guys don't touch him. And you're like, wow, that pitch looks like it's, you know, right down the middle and no one's hitting it. Um, you know, those are the types of things that, that uh, the tech can, can help us figure out. And so I think really getting a baseline of what, do, what do these pitches look like? What do the spin profiles look like? Um, and, and getting a baseline of that and then moving forward uh, from there, I think uh, rather than, I think sometimes it can, guys will just go in and be like, okay, the rap soda data tells me this, let's change it right away. Um, let's actually figure out what those look like before we start making any changes. Uh, I think that's an important piece of it. Um, but also, I think there is something that gets lost a lot of times is I, I know I found myself uh, doing this, being able to compartmentalize what you're actually doing in the bullpen. So if you're going to do pitch design, then it is literally a pitch design session. And if you're not doing pitch design, 
don't get lost on the actual coach player interaction side of it. Cause I, there were many times where I had the rap soda up and we weren't doing pitch design and I'm just getting stuck looking at an iPad. I'm not getting that human interaction or human element of actually coaching the player. And so that's where we need to be careful with the tech is great. And I love it. And it, and it really, it makes our job easier to explain something to the player that, that they're doing well, or, or maybe they need improvement on. Um, but actually building out your bullpen sessions in a way that, if you are specifically focusing on pitch design, that you use the tools. If you're not focusing on pitch design, you can still log the bullpen, but actually have that coach player interaction. So I think that's maybe a good starting point. Um, obviously, I think this conversation will go a little bit back and forth, but I think that's that's where I would start is really getting a baseline inventory of what your guys have um, and seeing what they look like. And then um, it, it might uncover some things of why they're successful in game that maybe you weren't thinking of. All right, so to piggyback off of that, since you touched on the college and professional side, I'll go to the youth through high school here. Um, well, I guess for starters, we need to kind of define what pitch design is because it seems to be some misunderstanding, especially on Twitter, about what that word or terminology actually means, right? So it's just a fancy way of saying that we're working on our pitches, right? Um, I think we're getting carried away thinking pitch design means we're coming up with something new, right? It just means we're working on our pitches. We're experimenting with our pitches, right? Um, and with the young guys, that actually starts with a fastball. Like working on your fastball is still what we would consider pitch design, right? So the young guys need to start there. Like that's where you need to start at. If you don't have a fastball, like a good fastball, there's really no point to go to something else. Develop a fastball first and foremost. And pitch design with a fastball, we're talking about, we're literally talking about trying to throw the thing with as best as you can through the target, right? We're trying to throw it as accurately and as fast as we can. That's pretty much what the idea that then we move on. Um, and as we move on from that, the biggest thing that I see is we're still trying to teach kids to, like, drag a toe or, or make the ball do this by slowing the arm down. Don't slow the arm down. Think from the youth standpoint, think every – not just youth, all the way through. Think every pitch is a power pitch. Throw it. Um, don't baby the thing at all. You don't, you, you, you're trying to trick the hitters, what we're trying to do there, any kind of off-speed pitch, right? So we have to sell it. If we don't sell it, we're not we're not trying to we're not upsetting their time in any way. They can see that. Um, so that's kind of where I'll where I'll, where I'll start, anyways. Awesome, yeah. And I think that's a, a great place to remember because you know we've had some kids that we've talked about with the uh, with even internal kind of conversations. We throw a, a four seam or a two seam fastball, and some of them might not even have a real differential. Um, Eric and, and Dan, why don't you guys kind of cover a little bit of what your guys work in and the pitch designers look like and uh, anything else you want to bring to this conversation? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been, you know, having the Rapsodo with us has just been, it's been such a valuable tool. And uh, like Harold said, start with the fastball and just kind of working off that and, and just figuring out what exactly each kid's fastball does is, is really that kind of a great base to, to, to building a whole pitch design uh, session or, or, uh, or a system. Uh, you know, if we have a young man that's uh, got a 17, 18-inch vertical rise on his fastball, uh, like Tony said, we shouldn't really be teaching him to pitch down in the zone all the time. He should be pitching up in the zone. And he should know that. He should get good at it. Um, and then, you know, and then if we have a kid that's got a little bit more run on his fastball, you know, he's not getting that vertical break, but he's he's getting some side spin and, and getting some, run, um, you know, good arm side action. You know, he's probably more of an east-west guy. And then that kind of builds into his other pitches once we figure out what the fastball does. You know, if he's an up-down guy, uh, we gotta we got to probably build out a, a pretty good overhand curveball to, to complement that. Um, that doesn't mean he can't throw other pitches, but if we're just looking at, you know, low-hanging fruit and, and building up a, a young player's uh, arsenal, you know, starting there. Um, if he's an east-west guy and, and you're able to show him, you know, his, his break plots on the chart, uh, and it's a good visual for them to see, like, hey, like, your, your, your breaking ball shouldn't be going – uh, up and down if, if you're if you got a lot of side run on your on your fastball you know, probably should go east and west and here's why and you show them on the chart um, and then even with the change up too a lot of kids think that their change up might be good because it's slow um, we can kind of show them like no we, we got to get your change up uh, you know break patterns away from your fastball a little bit more so we got to do these things and and you just see kids get super engaged uh, you know we don't start this stuff until you get pretty good and at least have a baseline of velocity um, and ability but um, you know a huge, a huge, uh, a huge challenge when, when coaching younger players is to get them engaged in what they're doing, and, and something like the Rapsodo on in a bullpen really kind of uh, heightens their awareness quite a bit, and they're able to really kind of get some instant feedback on some of the things we're working with them on. 
Dan, anything else you want to add? No. Um, this is like, I think this is where I know enough about like some of this technology and I can, I can understand it and I can speak to it, but it's, it's just not something that I dive into. I I'm, I'm on the training floor. I'm teaching kids how to squat and lunge and, and, you know, doing some of the more foundational work. Um, this is where having a, a well-rounded staff and having other experts and, and people who can uh, lead the charge on different parts of development is, is really valuable. So I, I pretty much stay out of a lot of this stuff. It's more, I get to watch. Um, and, and I learn a lot more than anything. So. Awesome. So moving to our last topic here, um, obviously this is a big one for young guys. It's always about that next level. It's getting to that recruiting section. Um, so Harold and uh, Tony, why don't you guys kind of start Tony from your side? What, what did you kind of see as areas where the best shot for players to make it to that next level um, that you really would focus on as a pitching coach? Um, and then Harold, why don't you kind of give us a little idea as to like some factors you feel are really important for players to be recruited? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, spending a lot of time as a recruiting coordinator at the college level. Um, you know, I wasn't at the division one level. And so velocity for me wasn't always the thing that I was looking at. You know, if, if a guy was, you know, an 88 to 92 mile an hour arm um, with some projectability, the, the chances of me getting that player um, at a non-division one level are probably a little bit low. And so I, I had to be creative with uh, what I was looking for. And so for me, a lot of times, um, we would recruit the breaking ball. So we would recruit how that guy spun a breaking ball. Um, and maybe if he was a, an 80 to 84 mile an hour arm, but he could really spin it. Um, maybe that was, we had success with building that the velocity in that guy, uh, but he had a good feel for how to pitch. And so, you know, a guy that, that is a dub player um, that, that just finished, you know, season got shortened is, is a guy that stands out to me. We've had some other guys, but Justin Sanders was a guy that I saw pitch a couple times could really spin a breaking ball and was like 79 to 82 in high school. Um, and, but I knew there was a mentality piece there. Um, he could spin, he could spin the ball. He was competitive. Um, and I knew he was going to work. And so those are the things for me as, you know, a non-division one coach that I was looking for. I've had a lot of guys, um, that we recruited that way, um, that maybe were a little bit under the radar, could pitch, could really spin it. Um, and if you could really spin a pitch, you probably have some decent hand speed and some feel, and maybe there's some maturity things that need to go on for you to get stronger. And then we, that's really where my desire to, to really dig into how do we build velocity in guys the right way, um, you know, in 2014, uh, that's how it all started. So I recruited a guy that maybe wasn't to his ceiling um, and then tried to figure out what were the things that I could put in front of him to get him to his ceiling. And so now I do have that upper 80s, low 90s, you know, projectable draftable arm um, that was overlooked in high school. And so um, for me, that's what I looked at. Um, I know for some, for some guys, um, you know, they don't really have that time to, to wait on projectability or building a guy out. They need that, you know, I'll, I'll use Santa Barbara as an example, right? Since we're, I was in that town. So at Westmont, I have time to develop guys at UC Santa Barbara. They don't, they got to win now. And so, you know, they really need that guy that's polished that, has, you know, two to three pitches that has velo um, that, you know, is ready to go right away to compete at that level uh, where we had a lot of success. Like I said, recruiting the breaking ball, recruiting athleticism, um, two-way players, you know, did he play in field? Did he play something else? Um, because usually if they, if they started concentrating on just pitching, if they were an athletic guy for their high school, that usually boded well for, for him getting better at the college level. So from a college standpoint, that's, that's really what I looked at. Harold, why don't you piggyback a little bit on kind of some of the things that you've seen um, be the best things for the guys to, to utilize to, to get recruited? Yeah, so look, I mean, this is no big secret, but velocity is a separator. Um, and I don't necessarily mean that you have to throw 90 miles an hour coming out of high school, um, but you don't see a lot of 72, 73 arms at any level of college. It's not going to happen um, as much as some of the, some of the college coaches talk about velocity being overrated, it's always the first question that they ask me when they call about a guy. Um, I, I just try to I tell guys that's checkbox number one. Um, once that, that is checked, then we can move on to the next thing. It's not the only thing, certainly. Um, you can't just throw hard. Um, but I, I look at this and I try to get guys to understand that there's, there's a skill side and a tool side. Um, in a perfect world, we're building both of them as high as we possibly can. 
um, but that's usually not always how it works, right? Um, so the skill side being essentially how good of a ball player you are, right? And the mental side, I, I, I link the mental side in with that. Um, and the tool side is just as the stuff we're talking about, like velocity, your breaking ball. You have to have something that sets you apart from your peers. That, that's what the tools are all about, right? Um, and then another thing is we hear a lot that mass equals gas, right? So we have this uh, mad dash for kids to put on a lot of weight at younger ages. And I'm always kind of telling these fringe type prospects to be very careful about that uh, because when you're tall and skinny, you got that projectability to you, right? Uh, that's what people think of as projectable. You start putting on some weight, they're going to say, eh, it's kind of filled out. I don't know how much better can you get. You can stay tall and skinny and be sort of there. Um, you're probably going to bode well for you. Um, and the other part to this, and I probably actually misspoke a while ago on the fastball pitch design stuff. Um, when I was when I was saying that we want to throw the ball as fast as possible, that sort of stuff, I'm really talking about the stuff I talked about earlier when we're talking about building athleticism, establishing good movement patterns. That's the stuff I think velocity development is at the younger level. So I want to make sure I made that clear. Um, but we just want to make sure that kids the, – the, there's, there's a big rush now for kids to throw harder at younger ages. Um, when a lot of times when the kid has great movement patterns, right, and he's 6'4", 165 pounds coming out of high school, and he's like 85 to 86 with a pretty good feel for a breaking ball, like, colleges are going to like that. Like, that's, that's that projectability we're talking about. Um, so you can be a little bit patient. I mean, it's very misunderstood um, because, of, because of that skill and tool side, right? Um, a lot of the parents get caught up so much on the skill side and just completely neglect the tool side. They don't understand that, um, you know, the 6'4", 165-pound kid throwing 85 to 86, um, it's a little bit wild right now. Uh, because he just had a huge growth spurt, right? And your son is 5'7", 165 pounds, and is really dominant against the same competition. It doesn't mean that your son is always going to have the upper hand on the guy with the bigger tool set. Um, that's just the only things I really want to make sure that I'm making a point to people. Um, and being mentally strong, like, we live in a society, I, I, I don't want to touch on this too much, but um, we try as parents, I'm a parent now, I've got two sons of my own, um, we really try to make sure that they don't fail, right? We want to we want to provide for them as best as we can. Uh, we want to take care of things for them. Um, but that doesn't always bode well when you're going off to college um, because the message I will send to any player that is listening, college coaches really ain't in the business of caring about your feelings. Um, they're there to make people better, the collective unit better. Um, you've got to do your part to keep up. If you're being a knucklehead – don't be upset when they call you out on it because um, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Um, so, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Awesome. And, Eric, I know, obviously, recruiting is a big one for you. Uh, we had a huge talk yesterday with our group uh, and have a nine of our nine 2020 guys get to that next level. Uh, so, kind of want to bring this home for us and anything that you want to add to it? I mean, both Tony and Harold nailed it. Um, you know, from a pitcher's point of view, uh, on, the, on the recruitment side of things, I mean, first, it's, you know, fast, small velocity matters. And, and, and uh, you, you, p kids and parents get really sensitive if, if the player doesn't have velocity and you're telling them that, but it does matter. And, uh, you know, it, and then you kind of got to work backwards a little bit from there. It's like, okay, you know, what kind of velocity can we get in you? What, how, how old are you? And then we get to that recruitment talk. It's like, okay, let's figure out who you are. You know, so if, if you're throwing, if you're a junior in high school and you're throwing 80 miles an hour and you want to play college baseball, uh, that's not to say your velocity will never come, but, you know, we're getting pretty close to, to ha having to, to set a direction on your recruitment process. So we're, we're going to put you on a different path than, than maybe the kid throwing 88 at the same time. Um, and, and we're going to look at some different options. And, 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 you know, even Dan can train you a little bit differently um, based on those things. So. Um, we really try to be super honest with the kids in the recruitment process. And, and a lot of that is based on fastball velocity. And, and then, you know, like Harold said, that projectability is a big thing too. You know, if you have a kid that, that, you know, yeah, maybe he's 85 and, and the D ones aren't necessarily there right now, but man, he's, you know, he's six four, one sixty, and he's got some looseness there. Um, you know, we can kind of advise him a little bit differently on hey, like, Hey, here's where you're at right now. But man, you know, if you do this in the next six months, you know, this could be an option then. So uh, it kind of just breaks down to what we've been talking about. you got to really individualize everything and, and give them that kind of honest feedback and advice based on who they are and where they could be. I just want to add one more thing to that, just because this is such a, a challenging subject for families. Um, I think our sport is so unique in that, um, you know, I've had guys playing the big leagues that played for me that, 
we're at a school of 1200 students. And so um, everyone's goal should be to play at the highest level. But in baseball, there's a development piece and a timeline that doesn't follow the same trajectory for everybody. And so really doing research on programs that um, have a track record of development is important. Um, you know, the last few years, we started to get a little bit better player because it started to be known that, hey, when you go to Westmont, you're going to get better. Um, you're not just going to stay where you are. They're not just going to roll the balls out. Uh, there's actually a plan in place um, where guys are developing. They're coming in at a certain level. They're staying healthy. They're getting better, and they're leaving much better than, than they were when they got there. And so um, I think if you're, if you're a player or a parent listening to this, baseball is different. You don't see a lot of Division II, Division Three NAI NBA players or NFL players. Um, there's a certain skill set that is different at that, those, those levels, but especially on the pitching side um, and, and the amount of development that has been going on at different places, uh, going to the place that's right for you, going to the place where development is a big thing if you need it. Um, you, can, you can have a great baseball experience at a lot of different places. You can start at a junior college. You can go to a Division two or Division three. Um, and develop in the right way uh, or an NAI program and, and, and reach a goal of playing professional baseball. I mean, I had, like I said, I've never coached a division one level. We've had, I've had four big leaguers. I've had, you know, over 30 players play professional baseball over the years that I've coached. It's like two, an average of two per year. Like you can have a great experience. You can develop, you can get better. Um, and it, you don't have to get stuck on this division one model. Yes. That should be your goal. Right, just like professional baseball should be everyone's goal, but that's not the reality for everyone. Um, but be open to different places. Um, you know, if you have if you have different levels in your area when baseball starts going again, go check them out because I think you would surprise yourself at the different levels, um, especially in different parts of the country. You go to you go to a California Division Three NAI D two JUCO game, you're going to see high velo. You're going to see guys with a lot of skill. You're going to see scouts in the stands like you're going to see something that maybe you didn't expect and you're just cutting yourself off to only being a power five or, uh, you know, a division one player. And I think that our game lends itself to development and getting better and having an opportunity that other sports don't. Hey, well said, Tony. Yeah. Look, you got to find the place that'll help you develop, not get tied to a, a label. That's for certain. Awesome. Well, yeah, this was great conversation with all of you guys. Uh, I appreciate all the insight you guys provided. Um, Tony, why don't you give us any your social media, any way that people can kind of reach out if they want to follow you, learn more from you. Uh, I don't know if you have any of it, but if you do, go ahead. Here's your chance. Yeah, I think uh, Twitter is probably the best way. My Twitter handle is at TKGool21. Um, I'm more than willing to engage in a conversation and help guys. I think um, whether a guy ever – this is from the college standpoint. Whenever a guy came on my campus, I felt um, – I had an obligation to a certain extent to, to answer questions and be a resource for that person because there were so many people in this game that did that for me. Um, and I've been fortunate now that uh, I've got the opportunity to, to coach in professional baseball. Anything that I can do to help, I am more than willing to, to do, whether it's advice, whether it's shooting me a video and asking for some breakdown. I am more than willing and open and like all of us have plenty of time to get that done these days. So uh, I would be more than happy to, to help guys in, in any way that I can. If you feel like you're I'm someone that could help you, please reach out. I'd love to do that for guys. Awesome. Harold, how about you? What's uh, where do we, where can we find you? Yeah. So I'm on uh, Twitter, Facebook, and pretty new to Instagram. Finally broke down there. Um, all of them are Mazingo baseball. Pretty easy. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I'm willing to help just about anybody as well. Um, I, I, I do, uh, I guess I better mention that. Um, little shameless plug here. Um, I wrote an e-guide last year. It's a 90-page e-guide on developing youth pitchers. Um, and then this year I added in um, some video content that goes along with that. I think we're closing in on uh, 30 some videos on there. I'm not sure exactly, but constantly adding to them and I'm, um, this whole talk of ground force, as you know, I've been on here recently. I just started putting a series together to help guys understand that. And it's all through there. Um, so yeah, you can check that. You can find that it's pinned on my Twitter handle. So that's the, that's the best place to find me as well. Twitter. So yeah, that's really about it. Awesome. Harold and Tony, we appreciate you guys coming in and joining us for these conversations today. Uh, Dan and Eric and I will be on again next week. And until then keep developing. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Dub Baseball, 
at ID3 Training and at Ozella Baseball. Thanks for joining us on the Talking Points Podcast. Until next time, keep developing.